the quick retaliation, a husband who used makeshift tools to exact revenge on all of the wrongdoers. Two police officers in a patrol car arrived at my garage, representing our blue-clad pals. From my spot beneath the elevator, I surreptitiously observed them. Seeing such contented police officers was unusual. As they got closer to me, their expressions grew more solemn. They stated they had bad news for me after verifying my identity. My wife was in the hospital after something happened to her at our residence, but they were unable to provide specifics. They wanted some answers, so they stopped me as I tried to go immediately. Sir, could you tell me where you've been spending the previous three hours? One of them inquired. I've been here all day, officer. Ask my two mechanics, please. I apologize, I did sneak out for ten minutes at around eleven in the morning to grab us coffee. While another cop noted which coffee shop I was at, another approached to talk with Mike and Pete. Sir, could you show me your car? He inquired. My truck is outside, of course. The man searched the inside, then opened the hood and felt the engine cold as a stone as I walked him outside to my pride and delight. That's it, sir. You are welcome to visit the hospital. As the hospital staff member described the severity of Kate's injuries, I had a worried expression. She informed me that she was currently having surgery after receiving a blood transfusion. The doctor's half-smile during our conversation struck me as quite unprofessional. The same two police officers who had been in the garage earlier stopped me as I was leaving the hospital. They were looking for further information. For much-needed coffee, we retired to the hospital cafeteria. They wanted to know how my wife and I got along. I clarified that eight years ago, we met and were married rather late. Kate was an accomplished lawyer for a big local firm. Since she wanted to establish herself in her career, she resisted my pressure to have children until she was over 40 years old. I was questioned about why she was at home on a weekday. I clarified that Kate had taken a sort of vacation before at least 10 years of domestic work, quitting her job a month ago to rest before becoming pregnant. I concluded by saying that I adore my wife, that we are doing well, and that we are eager to have a child. They wanted to know whether I knew someone named John Barton. They walked away without responding when I said no and inquired why they were asking. I went straight home since I knew I could count on my guys to secure the garage. The house was being searched by one detective and two forensic scientists. After introducing himself, the detective shared his knowledge. He then asked me one new question in addition to the ones he had asked the other police. Sir, could you tell us why we discovered a few blood droplets in the toilet downstairs? I'm afraid I don't know, detective. Can I ask you a question now? It's obvious that you don't consider this an accident and that I'm being investigated. Can you reassure me that you are searching for the true culprit in addition to focusing solely on me? Don't worry, sir, we have a number of avenues of investigation. Mrs. Barton is currently speaking with my colleague. I keep hearing about John Barton. Who is he? I apologize, sir, but I don't think I should comment. I was left perplexed when he and the CSIs left. I walked to the master bedroom upstairs and watched the action unfold. If I were seeing it for the first time, I would be genuinely surprised. Around 10 in the morning at work, I began to consider bonding. This is not out of the ordinary. It's said that men consider bonding 67 times on average during the day. Men who have been essentially separated from their wives for a month can, I assure you, at least double that. Or two or three times a week have nearly stopped when Kate left her job. Kate was either overtired, bored and despondent, or in a foul mood. In my opinion, she was simply afraid since her normal life was about to end. I didn't want to put any pressure on her because I'm a loving husband. At her own rate, she will overcome her phobia. After having kids, I knew that my life would change, but I also knew that hers would be completely appended. Anywhere, at any time, I kept thinking about how our physical lives had been in the early years of our marriage. In any event, we tried to keep it novel and exciting for as long as our imaginations lasted before gradually slipping into the automatic state that two long-term partners frequently experience. I jolted out of my days. I knew how to restore spontaneity. Head home now and sleep with Kate till you're out cold. All right, the choice has been made, it's time to leave and head home. I informed Mick and Pete that I would be gone for some time. Pete asked if I may test drive the car he had just completed fixing. I was disappointed to discover a strange car in the driveway when I arrived home. My plans were spoiled by my friend's visit, damn it. I made the decision to enter nonetheless in the hopes that my acquaintance would be convinced to depart and that my intentions would be preserved without any suspicion or attempt at concealment. I opened the front door. I knew my marriage was finished the moment my hair stood on end. Down the stairs came the audible noises of exuberant activity. Taking out the phone and beginning to capture footage was nearly instinctive. In order to avoid being accused of scratching the automobile, I always made a fast video footage whenever a client brought it to the garage. I hurried up the stairs, my heart racing, and with my video camera ready, I looked through the bedroom door. Yes, it was Kate, and yes, I didn't recognize the guy who was content to have her on our bed. I turned away, fighting the need to jump. To be quite honest, this was the most difficult thing I have ever done in my life. Devastated, I fell to the floor just outside the door when my legs could no longer hold me up. The fact that they were approaching their summits was only vaguely known to me. 
I'm not sure how long I stayed there, but slowly I realized that all the noises of their infidelity had ceased and that the only sounds left were talking. It still tore me to my very core and was equally awful. I understood that in order to allow myself time to think, I needed to get out of earshot. I had a gut feeling that any emotional response I had would, at the at least, put me in jail and him in the hospital. I needed time to reflect. Away from the sights, scents, and most of the sounds of betrayal, I stealthily rose from the floor, tiptoed downstairs, and slumped on the sofa. There were no emotional distractions for me. I devised a plan, doing what I knew best. Get him out of sight and out of the room, and beat the living daylights out of him in a place where he won't get too many bruises. Throw him out the back door, return for her, and then throw her out the door once the stomach is in perfect order. This should make a good impression on them and allow me to be completely free from witnesses and bruises. I'm hoping to avoid going to trial. Fortunately, my workshop was equipped with the ideal shock weapon. I was given the responsibility of emptying the vehicles we returned to base in the Army Reserve National Guard two years ago because of my abilities. I discovered a tiny gadget there that might now be useful. The police refer to them as stun grenades. They are essentially a little canister with a lever pin ignition mechanism, albeit slightly bigger than a typical grenade. In order to be thrown into a room full of innocent people without suffering any serious injuries, they were built especially for hostage rescue and were meant to cause minimal bodily injury. On the other hand, a human can be rendered completely stunned for at least five seconds by the explosion and flash alone. The remainder of the plan was rapidly formulated in my head, propelled by my newly discovered hatred. I couldn't just throw a grenade on the floor since I didn't want to destroy my house. I quickly glued a short length of rope to the device after removing it and looping the end of the rope. I made this and crept upstairs. I knew that stealth was no longer required as I drew nearer. From behind the bedroom door, I could clearly hear a man groaning, pausing only to answer the phone. Outside the door, I fell to the ground. I turned to face the doorframe. It sounded like the second round was well underway. My wife and her lover were having a lot of fun. I took a big breath, mentally practiced the steps, and sprang into action. I inhaled deeply and acted after mentally practicing the course of action I had chosen. Looped the end of the rope around the hook on the bottom of the light fixture, leaving it dangling halfway to the floor as soon as you enter the room. With your fingers pressed firmly to your ears and your eyes squeezed shut, remove the pin, place it in your pocket, and leave the room once more. The result was incredible despite my measures. Through my eyelashes, I could definitely feel the shockwave and the intense reflected light. As planned, I bounded back into the room, prepared to do something. It was my turn to be taken by surprise this time. I'm not sure what I was expecting to see, but it was very different from what I saw. The manhood below the waist of Mr. Anonymous, who was laying on his back on the bed, was obviously injured. Something was missing, or nature was very cruel to him. With her eyes vacant and her mouth opening and shutting like a fish out of water, Kate laid on her back on the floor. Perplexed, I returned to the hallway to reflect. Two hellish cries from the bedroom, followed by a series of noises and slamming doors, quickly broke the silence. I started to see how deep I was. Once again, my plan had fallen through. I looked around the carnage at the doorframe. With a banshee-like cry, the man rolled out of bed and curled up on the floor, clutching his groin. Kate was in the restroom, but she was nowhere to be seen. The evidence had to be taken out. Upon my return to the chamber, I swiftly located the device's detonator mechanism and attached it to the rope. I decided that everything else had been destroyed since I couldn't find anything else. I made my way cautiously to the restroom. Kate was vomiting into the toilet while on her knees. I simply didn't care anymore, therefore I didn't want to go and aid her. I saw something on the floor as I was walking to the entrance. The piece of flesh I picked up felt smooth and warm, like the tip of a tongue. I went into the first floor toilet and flushed it on my way to the front door. They refused to reattach it. Once again grateful that we lived so far away from the houses next door, I hurried down the street while trying not to screech the tires. I threw my pockets in a roadside garbage can on my way to the garage. I returned to the tiny garage that I referred to as work ten minutes later. I dialed Pete and Mike, two filthy, oil-stained men I refer to as my pals and co-workers. They rushed to me after noticing my alert. For the next 45 minutes, I need you guys to be my alibi. What are your thoughts? Almost at the same time, I heard, of course, boss. You may not respond right away after I describe what I did, but I must warn you that it is quite serious before you accept so soon. I'm not sure what charges I'll face, but it might include jail time. I walked into my office and put on my filthy old overalls before I told them this. After that, I went to the trash can and picked up an oily cloth, which I then rubbed on my hands and face. I anticipated the police to arrive, but I had no idea when they would. The boys gave me a startled look. I gave them a quick update on what had happened. Mike was the first to lose it. After attempting to hold on for at least 15 seconds, he started giggling. Pete joined Mike and myself in uncontrollably hooting after this icebreaker. We all took five minutes to recover control, and after exchanging handshakes and assurances of assistance, they went back to their greasy engine bays. 
The following hour was filled with impromptu giggles from several dismal rooms. Kate, my wife, was going to get what she deserved for avoiding my worthless buddies in the past. That night, I was tidying up the master bedroom. I just cleaned the floor in the bathroom. I made a mental point to get a new rug for the bedroom and threw out the bedding. It will also be necessary to remove ripped curtains. I tried not to think and to keep occupied. Constant phone calls and knocks on the door hindered this process. Indeed, there was a feeding frenzy in the media. For them, it was a story straight out of heaven, adultery and a man getting his manhood chopped off. I only opened the door once before cutting the call short. Now that I had nothing to divert me, I started to reflect. Do I feel bad about what I did? Odd, yet not. I have a strong dislike for cheats. Too many men have changed into women after catching their lovers, in my experience. It's funny because I was willing to stake my life on the notion that my wife was as passionate about this as I was before lunch. That I was so mistaken astounded me. Not to mention, Kate's motivation shocked me to no end. Our physical life was amazing, and she seemed to be as committed to me as I was to her. Well, such was the situation until lately. After hours of internal conflict, I was only able to locate one clue. I recalled how, two months prior, Kate's announcement that she was retiring to enjoy her final days of freedom made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. Her statement that she wanted one final chance before having children struck me as strange because I thought she would continue working until at least the seventh month of her pregnancy. My personal cell phone started buzzing, interrupting my thoughts. This number was not well known. It was Kate's parents' number, according to caller ID. Although they lived roughly three hours apart, they were in the same state. I responded since I always got along so well with them. Her mother got right to business after a lot less of the customary small talk. What's going on, Dave? Are you aware of the reason behind the journalist's siege on our home? Well, they'll have to learn eventually. I simply couldn't bring myself to elaborate. Did you watch the local news tonight, Mom? The major news, perhaps. How about a cheater who snatched away her lover's honor? Her mom's colorful vocabulary and outlook on life have always appealed to me, but wow, it made our conversations difficult. Yes, mother. I'll get right to the point because there's no easy way to put it. Kate is the woman's name. Fortunately, when I hit the end call button on my phone, a scream and a beep broke through my bewilderment. On the screen, I saw a warning. This brought to memory that only eight hours previously, I had written down the dissolution of my marriage. I vaguely remembered putting the recording on my phone outside the entrance to my bedroom. I was aware that I would never be able to trust a woman again if I never understood or accepted the motivation behind Kate's actions. It was likely that I would die a solitary misogynist, destined to be useless. I turned on the video with a frantic hope. I was aware of what it was displaying. Reliving the scene was too painful. Just as I placed the phone on the floor, I opened my eyes to see the ceiling of the hallway without any visual aid. I had to picture Mr. and Mrs. Adultery on the bed, laying side by side. I downloaded the file to my computer and played it via an amplifier because I was having trouble hearing it well. This is a crucial aspect of their discussion. It was amazing last week, Kate. It's been fantastic. In fact, is today really the last day of this? I'm still offering. Yes, it appears to be a good beginning for a marriage with a man who abandoned his wife and children. Just give me your word, and I'll divorce Sarah and marry you properly. No, and I'm too in love with Dave to do him that kind of harm. He's also a wonderful husband and will make a wonderful father. At least until our youngest child starts school, I will be Mrs. Goody, Goody, a housewife after today. It's impossible to love him that much. He isn't lying here with you. No, you're wrong. I adore him. I knew he was my lone soulmate the instant I laid eyes on him. I'll never see another. Physically, we are incredibly in tune. Having a wonderful man who spoils me and will nurse me as I gain weight from his two or three children makes me happy. No, all I want is to pass away in his arms with our grandchildren by my side. That speech was excellent, but it raises the obvious question, why are you now with me? Tate, at least, was human enough to consider it. For a good thirty seconds, there was silence. I suppose I simply longed for the past. I was a bit of a wild girl and didn't get married until I was thirty-one. I miss the excitement of guiding a guy forward and then making snap decisions about whether or not he gets what he wants, as well as the simple act of entering a pub and drawing attention from a variety of guys. Dave and his friends have been going deer hunting every other weekend lately. I made the decision to go back in time and check out a pub three weekends ago. As a result, there was one night that was passable but disappointing. Then we ended up together after I chanced to wander into the bar you were at last Saturday. Kate, you're so cold, my goodness. Think of this as the final hurrah. What are you moaning about, anyway? Come here, I said. Today was the last day. It didn't have to end now, I said. I switched off the music. I knew now, at least, that I was a good husband and lover. It was not me who was at fault. The days that followed were filled with total disappointment. After two days, the reporters disbanded and departed from my peaceful street. Kate would prefer some pajamas, the hospital administrator informed me over the phone. This one slipped my mind. These degrading hospital clothes are what she will have to endure. Her father phoned me two days later. 
He said he hoped I would stay in touch with him and apologized for his daughter's actions. He brought up the fact that he has another daughter who recently got divorced in an attempt to make things more agreeable. It's just too strange, Dad. I'm sorry. He appeared on the news once more for days following this incident. He has been discharged from the medical facility. After uncovering anything, journalists revealed that he was a habitual cheater. Therefore, they declared with some satisfaction that even though the surgeons had managed to reconstruct his manhood, it was quite improbable that it would fulfill any of its intended purposes. I had an unexpected visitor at the end of that week. Mrs. Barton was a lovely woman with sad eyes, or Sarah as she wanted I call her. I may have some proof that could aid her in her divorce case, she told me, based on rumors she had heard. I clarified that I couldn't admit it without revealing myself, but perhaps it was true. She was so sorry for asking, and she understood everything. I informed her that I believed she wouldn't require what I had because there was so much circumstantial proof. I'll convince her to come back and maybe alter her mind if this turns out to be incorrect. I felt sorry for her since she seemed so depressed. I took out the video clip and only played her after the great explosion. She initially cowered in fear at her husband's screams, but she quickly gathered herself. Let's just say that when she departed, she wasn't very depressed. When the melancholy came back, I invited her to come get me since I'm a helpful guy. Yes, I did see Sarah Barton again after that. The most peculiar guest I've ever had was definitely the most recent one. I answered the detective's door on set after we had a conversation at the house the day of the huge event. Only pants and a tea remained after the suit vanished. No, son, I will not enter. Just to clarify, I suggested that the case be closed if there was not enough evidence. He started to walk away after hearing my appreciation, but he paused and turned around. Listen, I'm going to retire at the end of the year. Will you explain how you did it to me when I return? I simply wished him a nice day with a grin. The next Tuesday, Kate's letter arrived. I can't tell you how sorry and humiliated I am that I did this to you, Dave. I forgive you without conditions since I completely understand why you couldn't bring yourself to come see me. I never considered all of the potential repercussions of my actions. Naturally, I had no idea that my parents would truly reject me. It pains me more than words can express because I know that I will always be without your love, trust, and respect. Allowing me to explain why I did what I did might aid in your healing, but I will understand if you never want to speak to me again. Make sure it's entirely my fault. I won't be able to talk normally for a long time, if at all, according to the doctors. They believe that when I bit off the tip of my tongue, I swallowed it. They inform me of an experimental stretching method that may help me regain some function. As a diversion from the drab, childless, and loveless future I currently face, I hope this succeeds and that I may at least return to my employment. In a divorce, you can ask me anything you want, and I'll sign it. I would always be appreciative if you could find it in your heart to keep me on your health and insurance list for the foreseeable future. Goodbye, my dear. I hope the future holds nothing but joy for you. I hope your life hasn't been totally wrecked by me. Your cheating wife, also known as your Kate. I must admit that I was so moved by the letter that I promptly changed my mind and sent her pajamas to the hospital. Where are the phone numbers for Mick and Pete now? Do I have a beer to give them? Each a keg. The main character's retaliation was excellent. He gained a solid alibi by acting shrewdly and craftily. My feedback. If you were in his shoes, what would you do, and would you dare to do it? Story 2. After 20 years of marriage, Sarah began cheating on her husband. I wonder if we can sympathize with her and excuse her behavior. I want to see my family and remind myself of the repercussions of poor decisions, even when it aches to pull back the curtains and gaze out the window. Across the street is where my ex-husband resides. There is a swimming pool at his residence. Our sons are out there having a good time, and I can't stop them. We don't have a set schedule for visits. In order to decide who will take the boys where and when, as well as who will feed them, my ex-husband and I frequently discuss the boys' daily itinerary. That's all we discuss. The lads have begun inviting girls, I notice. They must be at their highest level of testosterone. They display their large splashes and entertaining dives. It appears to be functioning. The girls chuckle. Despite just being 13 or 14 years old, girls' bodies appear older. Rob must have spoken to the boys. He may need to speak with someone. Given that she is over 40 and considered an old lady by the males, this fitness instructor looks stunning in a bikini. The traditional comparison of dental floss being larger than what's on it comes to mind. Am I being overly dramatic? Perhaps. Am I truly envious? Yes, I am jealous, damn it. Since I have primary custody, our kids technically reside with me, yet I don't have a pool. This is where they often eat and sleep. They have most of their clothing here. The house across the street is where the lads are accustomed to living. The family that once resided there was our family friend. They had a daughter and a boy who were roughly our boy's age. In a sense, the kids lived in both homes. Our children were on the verge of being adopted by Misty and Carl James. A lot of people thought Misty and Carl had four kids. It appears that our lives have been enjoyable. What went wrong, then? The response is that I started cheating. This is simply a truth and is by no means a declaration of pride. Although I didn't cheat for very long, I did it long enough to destroy my life and cause harm to my family. 
Understanding what I did and, more crucially, why I did it, required numerous therapy sessions. Perhaps this will help someone avoid going through what my family and I went through. Susan Lawrence is my name. Rob Lawrence was my spouse. David and Ali, our two boys, are currently 13 and 14 years old, respectively. I was an assistant editor at a publishing business. Rob had his own home and office security company. Although we only dated in between business trips for the first four years of our nearly 20-year marriage, he was a deputy in the military. On a blind date, we met. Amy needed a companion for her boyfriend's friend, but I was handsome enough to date myself. The MP with whom my friend Amy was dating was attempting to persuade his friend Rob to join. Despite the fact that Amy and her partner never married, Rob and I became close despite Rob's long-term departure. We had to make a snap decision about our relationship. Before he left, we needed to decide on a major matter. We were married. On nearly everything, Rob and I were in agreement. Faith, children, politics, and religion. Despite having multiple active suitors, the glow of marriage prevented me from succumbing to temptation during my waiting period. After his first two years, Rob left again because of a rehire bonus. This had a significant impact on our capacity to manage a home. Although it was really difficult for our relationship, we managed to get through it. Rob came back, and we made the decision to start a family. After I was sacked after four years of employment, he was hired by a security firm. For the last few months of my pregnancy and the first few months after, my company agreed to allow me work from home. We soon had two children, one year apart. Although difficult, life was good. I began to work more in the office after the boys left for school. Rob thought he could start his own security company when the security company he worked for chose to sell its share to one of the biggest companies in the country. He received starting funds in his favor. The financial risk made me nervous, but I had faith in my husband. He left the company in good terms, and a few of the guys advised Rob to give them a call when his company grew to the point where he needed more staff. He is. Before the firm started to take off, we squeezed and sacrificed for roughly five years. Ironically, heightened interest in devices that enabled people to snoop on their allegedly unfaithful spouses was the driving force behind the growth. I kept working. I enjoyed it. I got good raises every year. Since everyone seemed to have a book they had to write, the editorial industry was thriving. I enjoyed reading, and I felt that my viewpoints should be respected. Even though I rejected a lot of novels, I was able to make several better. I now believe that this is when I started to gain a greater understanding of who I was in connection to my husband. Rob and I didn't voice any significant grievances regarding our life. Our friendship was very fulfilling in terms of chores, money, children, and physical life. We fell into a habit since everything was going so smoothly. I was unaware of the potential threat. My issue with Rob developed very slowly. My attitude deteriorated further by the time we started to take each other for granted. Why do I have to do the dishes alone? How does he or the boys get to pick the restaurant? How come he never says the kind of things he used to say when he was wooing me? Why am I only acknowledged on Mother's Day, Christmas, Valentine's Day, and my birthday? Why is it that we constantly sleep together in the same manner? I started disparaging my marriage in a lot of ways, but I only asked myself these questions. Rob and I never discussed this. I believed that he would realize what was wrong if he truly loved me as much as I loved him. Why did I have to handle all of our problems? Despite my growing irritation and depression, I carried on with my household duties. I started to feel as though I was locked in a rut because of my routine. I changed, but no one appeared to notice. I turned more and more to work for myself. I didn't give personal praises at work much thought while I was content with my home life. I now looked for them and cherished them. I began to dress more provocatively, which I referred to as more trendy. I loved it when my husband saw that I had changed my clothes since it led to more comments, looks, and flirtation at work. They gave me more attention. Then I made a choice that completely changed the course of my life. My supervisor, Hal, and I were preparing the book for release. We knew we would need to work late Thursday in order to submit the final draft on Friday, but the deadline was nearly difficult to meet. Hal was one of my biggest admirers and flirting partners, which is one of the reasons I didn't mind working late. Despite being married, this did not take away from his attractiveness. But I'm also damned. Hal said, I'm afraid I've ruined your plans for a home-cooked dinner once we were done. Don't worry, Rob usually orders pizza on Thursday nights. On Thursday nights, he and the lads watch college football. They are completely unaware of my presence. I wouldn't let you leave my sight if you were my wife. I apologize for the double negative. I was shocked. I felt flattered. I was thrilled. I stammered, thank you. My family doesn't seem to value me at times. I told him this, but why? To make up for missing your meal, allow me to take you out. We went somewhere close to the office after I gave my consent. We finished a bottle and a half of wine at the fish place before deciding it was time to depart. It was a nice lunch. We laughed about topics that only teenagers consider while sharing details about our personal lives. Both of us acknowledged that our marriages lacked a certain spark. We both knew, I believe, that the course we had chosen was risky, but we persisted in it. I'll take you to my vehicle. I gave him a thank you kiss because it seemed like a first date. 
The kiss lasted close to a bedroom kiss but far longer than a thank you kiss. As we parted ways, we exchanged glances, wondering what we had just done. We both understood, I'm sure, that this was not the only kiss we shared. I couldn't stop thinking about the kiss and all the potential outcomes on the walk home. Compared to the daily events at home, it was a lot more thrilling and different. I haven't kissed another man in nearly 20 years. I was afraid. Is Rob going to notice how much I like spending time with Hal? Is it reasonable for me to claim that nothing happened? Physically speaking, this would be true because we each had a few pals with whom kissing was a common greeting and farewell. As I walked inside, I heard a baseball game being played on the big screen TV in the office. I've returned home. I yelled. Other than asking if I wanted pizza, I'm not sure what they shouted back. No, I'm grateful. I went to a fast food cafe for a snack. I lied about this, but why? In hindsight, I believe this marked the start of a psychological retreat that made it possible for me to see lying to my husband as more acceptable. I went to bed after leaving my husband and the other lads to play ball. The thrill of Hal's kiss had faded, yet it was hard to fall asleep. Rob actually flew into my bed while I was on the verge of falling asleep. The Wildcats won, sweetie. How likely am I going to score with you this evening? How old are you, my god? Tomorrow, I have a job. Leave me alone now. Rob simply exited the bedroom and the bed without saying anything. After a few minutes of still being upset with him, I felt bad about being so impolite. I couldn't get up and go apologize because of guilt. In the hopes of seeing Hal in my dreams, I settled down on the pillow. I have to realize that once you start acting dishonestly, you will eventually behave differently with those who trust you. There was no indication that Rob had slept in our bed when I woke up a little later the following morning. He had spent the night in the guest room, which I discovered when I walked in. The boys were eating breakfast at the kitchen table when I rushed downstairs to make them breakfast. Hi, Mom. Let you sleep, Dad told me. Before he left for work, he prepared our breakfast. I went to get some coffee. After working late yesterday, I needed to get some rest. Even though no one questioned me about it, I became aware that I was attempting to defend the time I had spent away from home. I had the impression that the defense lawyer and the prosecution were engaged in a mental battle. The boys soon left to wait for the bus outside. I completed my task preparations. I purposely wore one of my more traditional, older clothes. I suppose I was attempting to atone for my recent practice of requesting Hal's adulterous attention. I felt compelled to conceal my actions. It will assist if the clothing is less filthy. Before Hal and I handed the book we completed last night to the senior editor at 11, I stayed away from Hal. The editor had a few inquiries. Our meeting went on until lunchtime. Thus, it was only fitting that Hal and I have lunch together. Hal picked one of the greatest restaurants in town, the Golden Tree Hotel, and I suppose I knew what was going to happen. We drank wine with our supper, which was against corporate policy. During the first hour, we primarily discussed business. Hal advised us not to return to our office with wine on our breath when it was time to do so. He informed the office that we would not be returning today, and I gave my permission. So, what are we going to do with the rest of the day? I inquired after the call. The internal cheater still came out despite wearing a conservative outfit. Is everything caused by wine? Why don't we go into one of the rooms and finish what we started last night? This was the crucial moment. As I watched the promiscuous woman in my place respond, okay, I had the impression that I was flying outside of my body. I simply agreed to commit adultery, and I followed through on it, as my out-of-body self realized. The main reason it was exciting was that it was a new individual. He seemed happy, and I was in seventh heaven. But my sense of guilt grew with each step. I lied about how amazing it was when he saw this. He inquired as to whether we would carry on doing this consistently. That would be fantastic, I assured him, but I couldn't take the chance of being discovered. I suggested that we just consider it a one-time fantasy that would never occur again. Despite his disappointment, he concurred. Maybe he was right, I'm sure he hoped I would change my mind later. Personally, I wasn't certain about this. I was certain that everyone was staring at me and aware of what we had done when we exited the elevator. I rushed to his car and, much to my relief, arrived at my car parked at work. The flood started then. My negligence caused me to cry and weep. My husband was betrayed by me. I was putting my marriage at risk. For the sake of a subpar friendship with another man, I jeopardized the future of my family. I sobbed and went home. I had no idea what to do. I took care of housework after arriving home earlier than normal. I needed to distract myself from what I had done, anything at all. I had to hide it from Rob. My marriage needed to be saved. I had to act as though nothing had occurred, but I was only fooling myself. I started crying as soon as I saw Rob enter. What's the matter, Seuss? What has occurred? Are the boys doing well? I yelled out, I got into trouble, in between sobs. Have you lost your job? Have you been in an accident? I'm confident that we can work this out together. It must not be that awful. Oh, perhaps, Rob. I had an affair with another man. Rob retreated as I tried to embrace him. What are you? I'd slept with someone else. I only love you, I don't love him. Please pardon me. This will never occur again. The first time this happened, it shouldn't have. Or has this not happened before? I swear, this was the first, only, and last time. I swear. 
You made this vow during our wedding, I recall. I cherish you. I'm sorry, but your promises have lost all meaning. He had red hives on his neck, which only happened when he was under a lot of stress. I had to leave here for a bit. Don't give me a call. Don't leave me, please. If I stay, I'll just die. Rob, you could die. He made his way to the door. My spine tingled at what he said. His abilities and knowledge may be put to far worse use. It would be easy for him physically. I gave the boys food and gave them permission to swim with their pals across the street. I didn't even try to phone Misty and Carl. Both houses extended an invitation to our kids on a regular basis. I made use of this opportunity to try to persuade Rob not to file for divorce. I informed the boys that Rob had been asked to work security out of town and might not return that evening when they got home and he still hadn't returned. Since there was no school tomorrow, they complied with my advice and went to bed, staying up to play video games. I lie awake thinking about things like what I should do if I end up being a single mother. Will Rob attempt to harm Hal in an attempt to exact revenge or retribution? Oh no, Hal's wife and children were not on my mind. Rob won't hurt kids, of course. I found it more difficult to explain Rob's absence from home during the weekend. Luckily, the boys spent nearly all of their time playing with other kids. Rob apparently took advantage of this situation to discover that Hal was my lover. Rob arrived to our workplace on Monday and asked to see Hal while we were working together late on Thursday night. I was so anxious that I skipped work on Monday. Later, Hal informed me that Rob appeared composed. Rob expressed regret for his wife's seduction of Hal and hoped it wouldn't produce any issues that would affect my ability to do my job in the future. Rob took a few more hits before he stopped. Whether Hal called the police or not, he assured Hal it didn't matter to him. He would listen to the discussion he just captured and tell Hal's wife about our affair. Rob pointed out that Hal and I were free to do as much as we wanted after Rob divorced me and Hal's wife divorced him. Hal called his wife from the hospital while Rob was at his house. Rob had already prepared his wife, which was what he had hoped would happen initially. Hal need not be concerned about going home, she assured him. Rob didn't struggle when the cops came to get him at Hal's residence. He was imprisoned for serious assault. I volunteered to pay Rob's bail when I saw him in jail. It's time for each of us to learn how to take care of ourselves, he refused. What about the boys? I questioned him. You ought to have considered this before you chose to cheat, he said. While I was growing up, I had to deal with it. They won't find it simple, but I did it. They have the strength to achieve it, so don't worry. I had no prior knowledge of this aspect of Rob's home life. Rob attempted to prevent his public counsel from citing Hal and my adultery as a mitigating circumstance after he entered a guilty plea. He received 18 months in prison but only completed six of those months, so he didn't mind. For me and the boys, the past six months have been difficult. They always had a house across the street, and they knew I had cheated on their father, so I seldom ever saw them. Because I didn't want a divorce, I didn't file for one. We didn't discuss my infidelity or the reasons I cheated on Hal when Rob got back from prison. Rather, we discussed the boys' best interests. He consented to stay at the house for the boys, which pleasantly pleased me. He'll remain in his den, use the restroom downstairs, and sleep on the sofa bed. I dared not even inquire as to whether we could resume our corporeal existence. I was aware of the solution. In reality, Carl's move to a different state was the reason for our official divorce. Our kids were upset when their house went up for sale. The lads were more anxious about tea than Rob and I were about our issues. I was first unaware of Rob's reaction to the circumstance. He served me in my office and filed for divorce, which was the first indication that he had made up his mind. Hal and his wife were going through a divorce at the time. Rob didn't give me any notice. Although adultery was only pertinent in a divorce to settle custody disputes, he brought it up. All he wanted to do was arrange things. I wasn't really angry. I had been unfaithful. When the for sale sign was taken down from Carl and Misty's home, his next action became apparent. I approached in the hopes that they would remain. At that point, I learned that Rob had purchased the house. Everything made sense to me. For Rob, it was the ideal solution. Until I protest or we sell our house and move, he will see his boys as much as he and they desire. I will continue to have primary custody of them as their mother. He was prepared to assist me with household expenses as well as alimony and child support. His retaliation against me was to let me visit him and the boys so frequently in his home. A clever man. Until his next marriage, I made the decision to inform him of my single status. I'll remain accommodating to the boys. I'm not going to pressure him. He recently consented to occasionally join us for lunch. I am aware that his poor cooking skills are a contributing factor. I hope that the desire to go back to the past is one of the causes. I have hope because our dinners have started to feel like old family get-togethers. Some would argue that, objectively, I have nothing to be unhappy about. Despite my infidelity as a wife, I was granted primary custody of the children, the house, and child support. Since it was only one of my mistakes, I asked a few women for advice and they suggested that he be more forgiving. Some said that when he requested more time with his boys than I was required by law to provide, I ought to have objected. My comment, a good ending. We haven't had that in a while, but good thing it did happen. I hope these stories can support you right now.